In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We summarized again for the children the basic narrative of the gospel that we hear today, this account of the calling of the first four disciples who become really the paramounts among the apostles, these four, Peter and Andrew, his brother, and James and John, his brother. What we did not emphasize with the children is how surprising this story ought to ring in our ears. For there were schools in Palestine in those days, as there are schools among the Jewish people even to this day, of those who studied the law, who studied the prophets, and who looked for the coming of the Messiah. We should have expected that Christ would have gone there to call his disciples from those who had put time and effort and thought into looking for his coming. That he goes instead to the seaside. That he calls instead a fisherman. is more remarkable than we remember to notice, we who have heard this story so many times. It is still more remarkable because he didn't even go to the king of the fishermen. He went to unsuccessful fishermen who'd been out all night and couldn't even catch a single fish. It is not what we would expect from a teacher, from a king who is seeking to begin a movement that will transform the world. It is not what we would expect, but it is what Christ does. It is a paradox that is expressed with the same level of surprise and amazement that we ought to feel by St. Paul in the beginning of his first epistle to the Corinthians. He says, For you see your calling, my brothers, that not many wise, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of this world to put to shame the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put to shame the things that are mighty. For the message of the cross which we just finished speaking about, is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For the Jews request a sign, and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we seek and preach Christ crucified. To the Jews, a stumbling block and offense, and to the Greeks, foolishness, madness. But to those who are called, that's us, both Jews and Greeks. He is Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. The strange thing is that our effort, our energy is spent trying to be the opposite of these fishermen. We invest our time in study. We invest our energy in work. We put our thought into appearing to be successful to those around us, into building up our intelligence, our strength, our wealth, our dignity among men. We seek to be the best, and this is good. For Christ has called us to perfection. What we are reminded of by this story of the apostles is that our way, the Christian way to greatness in this world, passes through the valley of intense humility and weakness and need. For Christ will indeed bless those who follow him. He desires to give all the good things of this life to those of us whom he has called 
and that again is everyone here. He desires to give us peace and love and joy in our families, in our friends, fulfillment in our work and in our play. A fulfillment and a joy and perfection that indeed surpasses anything that we can imagine, certainly anything that we see set before our eyes on the television or in the newspapers as a goal for human life. What Christ offers is nothing less than perfect and absolute fulfillment of our deepest dreams and goals. And the best that we know lies in our hearts. But we must first turn to Him. It is not to be a structure that is built by our own hands, at our own will, by our own strength that we present to Christ. We can make no offering to Him that will earn His praise or His approbation. This is not how the Christian life is lived. We offer ourselves to Him as we are. And this is at once the most difficult thing about the Christian faith, for who indeed among us wishes to admit who we are now. Not in our dreams, not in our goals, not in our intentions, but now. Which of us wishes to be seen for that person alone? Yet, those of us who have lived perhaps a little longer will recognize that our intentions our goals, our dreams are not as much a part of who we actually are as we would like to think. And if Christ will accept us and receive us in our weakness, in our imperfection, in our need for Him, then that is good news that should bring great joy to our hearts and to those of all who encounter this reality in our lives. We are made this way for a reason, indeed. And it is this that the epistle reading today speaks of. For it says, Brethren, it is the God who said, Let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts which are dark with the passions and distractions of this world to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ. But we have this inestimable treasure in earthen vessels to show that this transcendent power is from God and not from us. We are always carrying in the body the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our bodies for while we live we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake so that the life of Jesus may be manifested even in our mortal flesh listen again we hold this treasure in earthen vessels we are the earthen vessels imperfect not clay not fired not porcelain not metal, earth, like a mud pie that our children would make for us. This is the vessel that we hold the treasure of the Lord in. And it is ourselves. And we hold this treasure in earthen vessels, imperfect, frail, prone to mistakes, prone to fall so that the power of God may be seen to be from Him and not something that we have created, that we have invoked, that we have built in ourselves. We build Christ in us by accepting our weakness. And this can have a profound meaning for how we live our daily life. For whatever our self-image, 
whatever our intentions and goals and dreams. Every one of us struggles on a daily basis or encounters struggles less regularly, but still days that weigh us down, burdens that we do not know if we have the strength to carry, sorrows that we dare not share with anyone else around us for shame or for fear or even for love, lest we burden them too. It is this pain, this imperfection of our existence that we are invited, we are called to offer to Christ, to allow Him to comfort us in these difficult times, to give strength to us when we are weak and to shine through the frailty of our existence, the glory of His eternal light. It is a different way of dealing with difficulties than we are automatically accustomed to. We are used to seeing a problem and fixing it. We set out a task, we set out a, the list of things that need to be done to resolve the issue and then we try to do it. Few of us wish to admit that there are problems in our lives which we have been unsuccessful in fixing, which we have been incapable of solving. But it is these that Christ wishes us to bring to Him. So that we come to the church, yes, dressed up, attentive, with our minds and hearts purified and prepared to receive Him. But also we must bring those imperfections, those sorrows, those struggles that are for us the cross that we bear through life. And if we can come to the Lord with those things, instead of seeking to shove them behind us and pretend that we don't need help, if we can ask for help, then we may well be amazed at what the Lord will do in us and with us and through us. If you take nothing away from the sermon today, I wish that you remember this verse. We have this treasure in earthen vessels so that we, it will be seen to show that the transcendent power is from God and not from us. From this day forward then, let us seek more every day to offer ourselves to Christ as imperfect earthen vessels, to follow Him first with all our might and all our being and offer our entire existence to Him so that He may transform what we are into the glory that He intends. Amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week. Amen.